Chapter 6, The Financial Decision. This is going to be a very interesting chapter. And this is the one-line summary. There are no right answers when it comes to financial decisions, but there are many wrong answers. So hopefully this chapter helps us to find out what are the wrong answers towards what to decide in a financial decision, right? What option to go with? Many wrong answers. So we will learn the tools to eliminate those wrong answers or wrong choices that we can take. So what instrument to choose is a two-step process. First step, when you want to find out what instrument to use is for you to forecast and budget and build a pro forma statements that we have covered from chapter two onwards. I'll tell you what are your capital needs? What does your business, based on its current growth structure, what money would it require? What operations um, scaling would require? What plant facility, etc., would be required? So build a forecast, that's the first step. Second, then design the right instrument that gives you the best amount of uh, money at the best terms that you as a company would want. So first forecast, second design an instrument. So the beauty of financial decision is that you can design your own instrument. There are many combinations of instruments that you can use for your financial needs. You can design your own instrument and your own terms. So the key thing to take care of is when you design this or you choose a financial instrument that it does not impact the operation, uh, the business strategy in any way. Meaning even there is a modest chance that you will impact the business uh, by taking on excessive risks or by designing an instrument that your company cannot fulfill the needs of those instruments and that's a bigger problem. So be very careful what instrument you design. And remember that this is not the one time that you're making this decision of whether to raise money through equity, through debt, through bonds. You will have an ongoing need as a business to make these financial decisions. So what choices you make today has an impact of the choices of the future. It can set you up for the better future, but it can also set you up for a future which is constrained, meaning you no longer have the borrowing capability or the capacity to borrow or issue shares. So remember that typically financial decisions are ongoing. So think about the long run. OPM using other people's money is a book by John K called other people's money it's a really interesting book but using other people's money has a lot of positives first you you get the tax benefit you can you you no longer need to pay taxes on the interest that you paid right? so interest is tax deductible so that's a big benefit but then there are three other things to keep in mind. One is the distressed cost, which we will go into in detail in this chapter. Second is incentives alignment of managers versus owners. And the signaling effect, like what information as company, company managers you're giving out to the market. Very much important, uh, it, it, especially when it comes to stock price impact and you use other people's money. So financial leverage, if it's like the leverage that we have in physics, right? When you use a lever, what you're doing is you are making a lot of movement and that generates force. So you can lift a huge instrument with a lever and you substitute force Actually, you substitute a lot of movement by the tremendous force that it generates. Similarly, you can generate through financial leverage a lot of returns 
return on equity. And you generate a lot of that return on equity by taking on a lot of risks, meaning your leverage goes up, so your variable risks goes up and variable returns happen, meaning your your returns are no longer straight line positive. They can go very much positive, very much negative, right? So that's what you take on to generate higher risk. And that is the financial leverage. So in this uh, table, we see a really good uh, summary in the textbook. So if you paid $1,000, you can make this financial decision to be a 100% equity decision, which is the first part of the table, or you can make it a 10% equity, um, actually 20% equity and 80% debt. So the first option is saying, hey, I'm not gonna take other people's money. And you, you see that you can generate 15% return because the probability of 50% uh, is a probability that $1,000 becomes 900 and $1,000 becomes 1400 is another 50%. So weighted probability of your return is 15%. But if you take debt, meaning 20% equity, 80% debt, meaning you only put in $200. So once you put in $200, take on 800 debt. And remember, debt is fixed payment. So you have to pay your lenders first before you as an equity owner get any money. So your return becomes highly volatile. See the leverage. Now the return to the owner is minus 90% to 160%. Whereas previously it was minus 10% to 40%. So large variation, but the expected return overall is 35%, much higher. So it's mathematically and intuitively it's a much better choice to take on debt. But is it that simple? to just take on more debt, right? No, and we'll find that out in the later part of this video. But in a sense, there are three options to a financial decision. You can increase equity, you can raise money through equity, you can increase and raise money through debt, or you can continue to raise more debt, right? So lever up more and more. So when you raise money through equity, your variability of return goes down, your risk goes down, your risk goes down, and so your returns variability goes down. Debt, the risk goes up, and return variability goes up. As an owner, your risk is high because you are committing a fixed percent of your returns to the creditor, the debt creditor. You're saying, hey, I'll give you a fixed amount of money no matter what happens. And whatever remains you have, you have already promised money to your debt holder. So that's why the return variation is high, risk is high. And if you have already a lot of debt and take on more debt, you are actually getting worse potentially by leveraging up. So what is an operating leverage? It's different than financial leverage. Operating leverage is basically saying, I'm gonna replace my variable cost with fixed costs, right? So using more of fixed costs and replacing that variable cost. For example, you have, let's say, a lot of workers in your factory, human beings. Those will be variable costs. Workers are variable costs because those workers, if they work 10 hours a day, which is a lot, they'll charge you X dollars. But if you make them work over time, they'll charge you X plus Y dollars, right? So the variable cost is high for human beings. But if you use robots, you can make the robot work eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or make it work 24 hours a day. The cost is the same. You have replaced your variable cost that human beings charge with a fixed cost. It may be costly in the beginning, but once you break even, once you break even, the cost for the fixed cost that you paid for a robot, the profits raise significantly after the break even point. So that's operating leverage, using more of what you have, utilization. And that's different than financial leverage. We just saw financial leverage is using debt. But it's very similar in the principle, right? With financial leverage, 
what you're saying is, hey, I'm going to replace my variable cost to me as an owner with fixed cost payments to the bank. You're saying, hey, look, I'll give you the fixed money up front. And so if if the company goes beyond the break even point after financial leverage, meaning it has serviced the debt that it needs to service, all the money after that is going to the shareholders. Remember the 160% upside that we saw in this table, right? Versus the 40% that we see in yellow versus 160 in green, second last column. Huge, right? Look at that, 160% versus 40%. So this is the variable you've replaced, but you replaced and said, hey, I'm gonna give this, you added this new green debt fixed cost. You've added this fixed cost. So your returns become more and more variable. How do we put this mathematically? We can do that by saying return on equity is return on invested capital plus return on investment capital minus the interest times debt over equity. So how do we get this intuitively, right? Intuitively, what is return on capital? We'll get to that, but let's what's return on equity. So let's see, we can write return on equity, ROE equals EBIT minus I times D divide by E times one minus T. So what is this, right? Return on your equity. So what is your return? Is your earnings before interest and taxes. So that's the raw earnings that you make. So what do you do? You subtract from it the interest that you have to pay, right? And so you, once you subtract that, that's the amount of money that, uh, and how, what's the interest that you have to pay? It's I times D, interest rate times the debt that you've taken on. So when, that is your real returns, right? It's not EBIT is not your real returns. Real returns is EBIT minus I times D divided by E. But there's this one minus T because you have to pay taxes. So again, you not only have to pay your bankers, your creditors first, so you, ret you multiply that by one minus tax, so 40%. If you pay taxes, then this whatever earnings you made, you first pay to your um, creditors, which is I minus ID, and whatever remaining you have, then you pay taxes on that. That is your return on equity. So if you if you reshuffle this, we can easily see that ROE intuitively we came up with this formula, and then if you reshuffle this, you can say EBIT times E one minus T, and Reshuffling this formula gets us this ROE equals ROIC plus ROIC minus I D times E, right? And the relationship between ROE and RO and EBIT and ROIC is on this red. So EBIT times one minus D, one minus T equals ROIC debt plus equity, right? So in a sense, we know EBIT times one minus T is basically how much money you have your your equipment is making is equal to return percentage of the debt and equity your company has. So if you use that formula, you get this ROE equals return on investment capital uh, plus ROIC time minus I D by E. And I dash is after tax interest rate, right? So I dash is equals I one minus T. But in a sense, what we are saying is that there's this new thing called return on invested capital. We know return on equity, and now we have return on invested capital. So summarizing ROIC is a percentage return of EBIT after tax divided by all sources of cash on which the return must be earned. So if you divide EBIT, if you just see this formula here, EBIT times one minus tax divided by D plus E is ROIC. So if you know EBIT, you know debt, you know equity, you know tax, you can get ROIC. So ROIC is a very important metric. It tells you the overall. So taking an example, let's say you have an ROIC of 9%, interest rate of 3%, debt 300 million, equity 600 million. So then what's your return on equity? Return equity is ROIC plus ROIC minus interest debt by equity. So this gives us a very good formula, which says return on equities ROIC plus 
the extra that comes from using the leverage. See, your return on equity is higher than return on equity. Return on equity is higher than return on invested capital because you now added leverage. Yeah, so return on equity is higher when when you actually when your leverage is actually working for you. If it doesn't, then ROE would be smaller than ROIC. That's a good way to check which company are actually, if ROE is greater than ROIC, that's a good thing, right? That means there's a positive factor that's the leverage is adding value. This is the adding value. But if this this was 1% ROIC, then in a debt is 3%, then you're actually, company is better off not making those investments. It's not returning even the interest that it has to pay on the assets that it holds. So this is this chart shows in probability um, that the same table above, right? Minus 10% to plus 35% uh, ROE, which is unlevered, versus uh, with a 22% ROE when you lever up. So that you see the distribution is much more wider if you lever up. So there's a higher chance of bankruptcy too. Meaning if you if you are somewhere here in this zone and during a tough time, all of a sudden you're negative. So important graph from the textbook that I've just recreated here. So range of possible outcomes is high. So when you have a lot of ROE uncertainty and if, if that uncertainty on return lasts for a long time, if there's a recession, you are in deep trouble because there could be bankruptcy. And so large persistent debt payment burden will actually wipe you out. So leverage while it has the plus of increasing your return on equity, if you cannot service your debt, you are in deep trouble. So very careful. So how do we measure the impact of leverage? There are two possible impacts on leverage. Impact of leverage on risk that you take on and impact on earnings. We saw the positive earnings, right? So what is the impact on risk? How do you do that? You, as I said earlier, create pro forma, create ratios, coverage ratios, say, hey, what is the risk you're taking on? The risk is you can't pay your debt. So you create uh, ratios of uh, times interest earned or times the burden that you can cover. Because you'd wanna calculate like, what is the margin that you have for interest coverage to fall to one? Ideally, it should be greater than one. If it falls less than one, that means you can't pay, your operations can't pay your interest uh, obligations. That's a problem. So that's the risk. So you want to find out how much margin you have and then compare it with the industry of what are your ratios, current your company's ratios and the companies in your industry, what are their ratios? And then check what's the impact on the bond ratings because if you take on more debt, now all of a sudden you could be downgraded and all of a sudden now your capability to take on more debt further reduces. So that's the risk that you're taking on, right? And, how, and you, you compare benchmarks, you compare bond ratings, you check how much buffer you have. Similarly, there's a positive side on earnings. We saw take on more risks, lever up, you can get an ROE bust. ROE boom, sorry, you can actually make ROE better. So return equity goes up if you take debt. Um, but you have to do boom and bust scenarios. You have to look at these red lines, you have to draw like, hey, what is my EBIT in the boom scenario on this side, right? This is a boom scenario EBIT and then bus scenario EBIT, and then check where are what is your expected EBIT. If the expected EBIT is somewhere in between, you will see that the bond financing, the blue line, gives you better return on, equi return on equity than the green line, which is purely equity finance, right? So that's your, that's your overall positive impact on ROE. So risk, benefit, right? So now, how much should you borrow, right? We saw the risk and benefit. So Modigliani and Miller, right? Franco, Modigliani, and this is Miller. This is two people got a Nobel Prize for sharing a very counterintuitive counter revelation, which says, when the operating cash flows are unchanged, capital structure decision is irrelevant. So that's really interesting, right? He says, uh, when the operating cash flows are unchanged, the amount of debt a company carries has no effect on its value and hence should be of no concern to value maximizing shareholders and managers. 
all he's saying is that if you ignore taxes, which is not real, right? But he's saying hypothetically, if you ignore taxes and if you assume constant cash flows, then um, the capital structure is irrelevant. How what percentage debt you have, what percentage equity you have, doesn't matter, right? And there are some intuition behind this as well, which is which is why they got the Nobel Prize. The intuition is a company really makes money because of the plant equipment and the people that it has. It doesn't matter if it's a creditor who owns the company 80% in debt or 20% equity owners, they'll make some cash flows, right? So if you change that holder of that company real assets to 80% equity and 20% debt, does it mean that the company all of a sudden is different? No, it's the same building, same people, same machinery, same output. So capital structure should have no implication. So that makes sense, right, intuitively, and that's what they shared. And that's why they got the Nobel Prize. And I think they also shared this other key insight, which is like, if your company doesn't take on debt and it's purely equity finance, you as a personal shareholder can take on a lot of debt. So you can make a homemade decision by your own personal finances, take on a lot of debt, which is equivalent of your company taking on debt. So you can reverse companies, the investments that you have, the decisions that they make by making your own homemade decision of taking on debt. So it's irrelevant. Company, Company's capital structure is irrelevant if the cash flow is constant. But this falls over when you introduce taxes, right? And that's why we have uh, Higgins' uh, Five Forces, right? He, the, the author of the book, Higgins, wrote, created this fi financial decision is important and capital structure is important. And because of in real life, you have taxes, right? And so what are the five forces? And what those forces would encourage you to do is important, right? So first one on the left, we see market signaling, right? Um, if you if you take on more debt, then you're you as a manager of the company or the CEO of the company or the shareholder, you you are giving a positive signal to the shareholder, saying, "Hey, look, I'm willing to take on debt. I don't want to dilute your equity." And taking on more debt means that. They're willing to pay and service their debt. They, they feel that they can actually do it. So if you take on more debt, then it's a positive signal. But on the contrary, if you issue equity to raise money, then what's mentioned in the chapter is that 30% of the money raised is actually lost when you tell your market cap goes down by 30%. So if you want to raise 100 million, your market cap, when you announce that you want to raise 100 million through equity, goes down by 30 million. So you already lost 30 million of the value by just announcing. So the positive is also there, meaning if you announce that you're gonna take on more debt, that means the market cap goes up, people like it. So market signaling is important, positive, in, positive support for taking on more debt. We saw tax benefits, right? If you have tax shield that you can use, if you, have, if you are paying taxes as a company, then you can use more debt use the interest that you pay as deductible to those taxes, you pay less taxes. So that also encourages people to take on more debt. Similarly, management incentives would be more aligned between creditors and, and uh, operators, right? Because there are these creditors who are breathing down the neck of the managers saying, hey, look, give me my money. If you don't give me my money or give me my debt payment, then they're gonna go into bankruptcy, they're gonna force you into bankruptcy. So uh, creditors breathing down management's neck is important because now all of a sudden they'll stay tight, they'll get uh, continuous cash flows. So it'll keep the owner's uh, incentives aligned with uh, managers, manager's incentive aligned with the owners. So all three are positive encourager, encouragement for taking on more debt. But there are two areas which will be helpful uh, to, to, to consider if you wanna take on more equity. Uh, financing. So it, equity financing gives you future flexibility to take on more debt. Let's say you take on more debt, now all of a sudden we saw your bond ratings can go down, your leverage ratios can go down, you have to be more efficient. But if, we, if you give out equity, now all of a sudden you have the future option to take on more debt. So you don't forego your future access to the debt market because you've not used that option. So you become more flexible in case you have a a business opportunity where your competition is getting uh, into a price war and you want to raise money and you want to not lose market share, 
and you have any other competitive idea, now all of a sudden you have access to cash through debt. But if you already used it previously, then you've lost the future flexibility. Distressed cost also helps uh, to consider distressed cost. Indirect costs, right? If, if let's say your company is uh, in trouble and you're a CEO, what would you do? You would be more conservative, right? You will not take on um, more difficult projects. And so when you do that, your suppliers find out and then they'll give you less credit. And so there's a negative loop that happens when, when, uh, when there's a distress meaning there's a problem in the company. People lose incentives to work hard and so many things can happen. Um, even bankruptcy costs when they are high because you can't pay your debt, then equity is a better, if the distress cost is high, then equity financing is, is a better option because of indirect costs, conservative managers, you know, who, who, would, who would gamble. They'll be like, hey, look, we have nothing to lose. Let's just, uh, go for a high risk, high reward, because we are already going to be broke, right? So equity, again, signals, you can use equity, but it signals that there is potential distress inside. So that's the Higgins five-factor model. So there's a pecking order, clear order in which you should uh, consider internal sources of if your operations are strong, retained earnings are strong, use that, use depreciation, and other sources for uh, the money. Then go to debt through banks issuing bonds and then eventually equity. And so we've seen in the last 30, 40 years, uh, equity is the least used instrument for uh, supporting financial decisions and raising money. So in a sense, there are two areas. If you're a high rapid growth company, then you would want to be conservative on debt because you would need debt at, in future. But if you're a slow cash generating machine, then you want to be aggressive on that because you, when you lever up, you create, uh, you make your business more valuable. You increase the size of the pie. Uh, you also use taxes to your benefit, right? So when you use taxes to your benefit, all of a sudden, you know, there are these three people that take the money from you, right? Uh, the company profits used by the taxes of the government, number one, they take, they are the first people who get the money and then the creditors and then the owners, the equity owners. But if you introduce debt, what's happening is now all of a sudden the government's saying, okay, you can deduct, you, you don't have to pay me as much in taxes because those uh, interest expenses are tax deductible. So then that money goes from the government to you as owners. So company profits, uh, you can increase the value to owners if uh, if you take on debt, which is which is a big understanding here. So if you are a cash generating machine, you're better off levering up as long as those uh, distressed costs, you see clear um, cash flows coming in. If you see that impacted in a downtrend, then you'll be worse off by taking on debt. So value of a firm levered equals value of a firm unlevered VU plus value times T times I. T is corporate tax and it, I is interest expense, right? Which is value TI is present value of all future tax shields. So your tax shields now become part of your levered value, right? So your levered value VL is always gonna be higher than the unlevered value, right? So that's about it. Um, and I'll end with this final thing in the green, which says banks prefer to give money to those companies that don't need it. And that's for this reason, right? Because they, they generate strong cash flows. It helps them lever up, increases the size of the pie. You know, bank has more money to make, right? And uh, the duration of your maturity of taking on debt should be self-liquidating, which is basically you want the company to make enough money that it can automatically from its operations pay the debt right? so it self liquidates the maturity over time so really interesting how you can increase the value of the firm by taking on debt and how it's important 
to uh, make a financial decision in an informed manner. And remember, at the start of the chapter, we said there are no right decisions, but there are many wrong choices that you can go through and hopefully make uh, a better risk assessment of all of these options and then assess where you are in the life cycle of the company, what risks you see, how many of them are valid, then make the right call. Chapter six, done.